Integrity can be a, a launching pad. Now, just to review quickly, we know that integrity speaks to oneness. It speaks to being unified. It speaks to everything coming together and working together. In sign language, this refers to something like something mechanical, like an engine or something, or things fitting together. You see the, you see the cogs there? That's sign language. And that's the way the body of Christ is supposed to be. We have different gifts. We have different strengths in our lives. We bring it all together and we offer it up to Jesus in the body of Christ. And it makes the church and the kingdom of God run and work effectively. Amen. And integrity is almost like the, the, the grease or the oil that makes it all run smoothly. How many of you know that you can have great gifts and great skills and talents, but if you don't have the anointing in the presence of God, there's going to be more conflict than there should be. There's going to be more friction than there should be. The kingdom of God does not need any more friction. Amen? We need some of that oil of the anointing, the Holy Spirit in our lives. And integrity can help to add to that because integrity does mean to be unified. How good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like, we talked about this in the past teachings, it's like the anointing oil that flows down over the head, over the beard, and onto the skirt. Amen. It makes things happen and work better. Praise God. So integrity is like the launching pad to success. Before a man or a woman can really be effective in offering their gifts to the body of Christ, to the kingdom, and even to the world, that person needs to develop character or integrity in their life. You've heard it said before, but I'll say it now. Integrity is essential because of the fact that character, <clears throat> when character is not developed in a person's life, their giftings may open doors and present opportunities, but it takes integrity to stay there. And that's why you see a lot of great gifted people rise to the top, but they don't stay long. It's not long before you don't hear of their ministry anymore. Or perhaps they've fallen and you hear of a, a sad situation of someone who was used greatly of God and now they're not in the ministry. What's happened there? There's a lack of character. There's a lack of integrity that's been built into their lives. So what God desires to do is build into our lives integrity, which implies character, which implies honesty, which implies equity, which all summed up is called righteousness. Integrity and righteousness really are the same thing. And when we have that working in our lives at a, uh, at a mature level, then we're able to go out and minister and we don't have ministry falling apart. It's not consumed in the fire, but it lasts and it stands. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 7 verse 9 um, shows us or reveals to us God's attitude toward wickedness and his participation in our lives. He personally sits and stands in our defense and rules on our behalf that we might be his agents of integrity in the earth. The scripture actually says this, Oh, let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. So the Bible's telling us here that God will establish us if we walk in righteousness or in integrity. God will build a foundation in your life that can't be removed, that you can't be taken off of. Uh, the message translation puts it this way. Take your place on the bench. Reach for your gavel. Throw out the false charges against me. I'm ready, confident in your verdict, innocent. Close the book on evil, God. But publish your mandate for us. You get us ready for life. You probe, probe our soft spots and you knock off our rough edges. So the Bible is saying here that God takes responsibility for the righteous. He takes responsibility for those who have integrity. And where our integrity is lacking, he begins to work on us, amen. He takes his chisel and his hammer. He takes his sandpaper. And he begins to chip away and sand away and begins to smooth out those rough places so that our integrity becomes like a mirror reflecting the glory of God, reflecting God's goodness and God's righteousness. Integrity is not about 
people recognizing me and giving me praise and glory for being a good person. It's about people seeing Christ in me and praising the Lord for what he's done in my life. Now, integrity and righteousness are seated in you when you're born again. Because we know the scripture teaches that we are the righteousness of God in Christ. So in us at salvation, God imparts his righteousness. And that righteousness, as it begins to grow, and as it begins to mature and develop in our life, we begin to come forth presented as a man or a woman who has integrity and character. Amen. There's a mandate upon you and me to abandon wickedness and enter into the works of righteousness. This passage assures us that God has personally worked to get us ready to knock off the rough edges so that integrity, in integrity we are launched into effective ministry and life from a good start. Uh, it's so important. And I know how it is, especially with younger people that have a call on their life. They get excited. They want to serve God. They want to do great things for the kingdom. And then it seems like God says, okay, I've called you. I'm going to do great things in your life. Now you need to wait, wait, wait. But we want to jump out there and start doing things for God. But God says, let me do a work in you and build the character in your life so that when you are used, you will be used powerfully and a great blessing. Uh, integrity is God's cause. We read this a couple weeks back. Psalms 35 verse 27 says, let them shout for joy. And be glad that favor my righteous cause. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And my tongue shall speak of thy righteousness and of thy praise all the day long. So the scripture is telling us here that if we will agree and support God's righteous cause, or we could say God's cause of integrity, then God will rejoice in our prosperity. What it's implying is, is that as we serve the Lord, then God is going to serve us with his grace and with his mercy, amen, to help us to be the person we should be and to do all that he's called us to do, amen. So how does it start? It starts with us saying, God, not my will, but your will. God, not my ministry, but your ministry. That's where we start building integrity. That's where character begins to, to work in our lives. It's when we... When we Fight the desire for our own personal ambition. And we say, God, I humble myself. My calling is to fulfill your desire. What is your dream, God? What is your vision? And then, God, that's what I want to do and become. Yeah, ministry will begin to engulf you. And people will refer to the ministry that you have. But all along in your heart, you know that I wouldn't have anything if it weren't for him. And so who gets the glory? He gets the glory, amen. He gets the praise, amen. Praise God. We said that integrity is power. And uh, we said that God great, grants great authority to men of integrity. And we read from Psalms 29 too. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked beareth rule, the people mourn, the scripture says. And we learn from that that the word authority can be translated increase. When the righteous are in increase. But we've got to avoid the worldly mindset. Increase in the kingdom is not the same as increase in the world. Increase in the kingdom means that we are becoming like Christ. Increase in the kingdom means that we are being elevated to fulfill that righteous cause of the Lord. Amen? So God begins to give us authority. He begins to empower us so that we can carry out his mission and his purpose in the earth. Amen. <coughs> and do great exploits for him. Integrity brings promotion. Can you say promotion? Everybody likes promotion. And everybody is believing God for some kind of promotion. But with God, the external promotions are secondary. To him, the internal promotion is the primary thing he's after. So God wants to promote you internally, and when you're promoted internally, then that power or that increase upon your life will move you to the next level externally. Do you, are you following what I'm saying? Externally means in the eyes of men, in the eyes of people. You want favor with God, and then you want favor with man. You get favor with God, God will see that your favor flows over into the eyes of man. 
The external promotions is the promotions within the church. It's the promotions in your job. It's the promotions in your family or in your community as God begins to elevate you and increase you so that he might work through you to a greater capacity. So let him work on the inside and the outside promotions will come naturally. Uh, promotion is for the man of integrity. One must be aware that a man's gift can take him where his character cannot keep him. Many young people have risen quickly because of anointing and gifting only to crash and burn soon later. It takes integrity and character to sustain the test, the resistance, and the temptation of promotion. Do you know so many people think that promotion means you're going to have an easier life. You know, if I could just get up there, you know, where brother so-and-so is or where this person is or where this person is, then I'd have it made. I'd have money and my life would be easy and I wouldn't have to deal with the stuff I have to deal with. But that's a misunderstanding. That is a deception of the devil. Promotion always means you're going to fight bigger devils. Promotion always means you're going to solve bigger problems. Promotion always means you're going to deliver people who are closer to the gates of hell. Hello? Promotion means you're going to work harder. Promotion means you're going to sacrifice more. Promotion means it's going to cost you. Yes, there will be rewards that come from promotion, but you will earn those rewards because you've been promoted due to your faithfulness and due to God's purpose and destiny on your life. We're not all destined to the same purpose. We're not all destined to the same level or place. But we have a specific gifts and callings. And God will promote us within our gifting and our calling as it pleases Him and as we're able to serve Him. Psalm 75, and you probably heard me teach on this in the seminary or somewhere else, but it's essential to point this out today when we talk about promotion in the light of integrity. The scripture says here, Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks. For that thy name is near thy wondrous works declare. When I shall receive the, receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. And to the wicked, lift not up the horn. You know what the horn is? It's not something you toot when you're unhappy. Amen. It's not something you squeeze and, 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 and make a loud noise when somebody gets in your way. Your horn, as far as typology is concerned, in the Old Testament was your gifting or your anointing. It was your appointed place of destiny. King David's horn, the Bible says, was exalted when he finally sat on the throne. But how many of us know he was anointed by the prophet and then there were seven years, seven difficult years he continued to sit on the hillside and watch sheep. For seven years, he's thinking, I'm the king. But in those seven years, nothing changed. In those seven years, he didn't get to sit on the throne. He didn't get to give any decrees. He didn't get to uh, operate in judgment or, or disclose his great wisdom as the king of God. No, he continued to do what he was doing. Why? Because God was building in him character. God was building within David integrity. Amen. And this is what God does for us. Verse 4 says, And I said unto the fools, Deal not foolishly, and to the wicked lift not up the horn. Don't try to put yourself in a place of promotion or authority that you haven't deserved or that God hasn't put you in. Verse 5 says, Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion, verse 6 cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south but God is the judge he put it down one and he setteth up another verse 8 for in the hand of the Lord there is a cup and the wine is red it is full of mixture and he poureth out of the same but the dregs thereof all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them but I will declare forever. I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. Verse 10. All the horns of the wicked shall be cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. Now, this is a powerful passage here. And I remember years ago when God began to give me understanding about this. And you, you hear me bring this out frequently in different settings because I believe there's a truth in here that we all need to grasp. Integrity attracts the attention of God. When he needs someone to fill an important position, promotion comes from the Lord. 
When God says, ah, there's an opening over here. I need someone to deliver Israel. What does God do? He looks throughout the earth and he finds a Moses. He looks throughout the earth and he finds a prophet. He finds a pastor. He finds a teacher. He finds a chaplain. And he says, I'm going to begin to promote this one so that this need will be met. What does he look for? He looks for righteousness, integrity, and character in the person. We look for all the skill. We look for all the gifts. We look for all the strength and the power and the might. But God says, no, I look at the heart of the man. Because God understands that skill, talent, ability, and strength can only last for so long. Sooner or later, you got to go to bed. It gets dark. Sooner or later, you got to take a vacation. Sooner or later, your physical body has done all it can do, and it needs to be refreshed. But one who is anointed <coughs> operates out of the Spirit of God that presides in their heart. And if they have integrity and their life is filled with righteousness, the work is accomplished by the anointing and by the Spirit of God. We don't have to work at it. We don't have to force it to happen. It comes naturally. And we just simply work and wait on the Lord. Amen. So the scripture declares that God sets up one and he puts down another. Not the pastor, not the leader of the pack, or the supervisor at the company, but the Lord. Promotion that happens in your life or my life comes from the Lord. Marriage comes from the Lord. Uh, I can remember <clears throat> when I was a young man and I began to think maybe I wanted to get married one day. Well, you know, I had to wait until God put me in that position, until God brought that person into my life, until he was ready, and he wasn't going to be ready until he thought I was ready. And even after I got married, I ain't sure I was ready. Hello. But what do we do? We trust in the grace of God. And God helps us to, as Paul said, work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. You know what that means? That means that once you have chosen to stand in the place that God has placed you, you realize that number one, I'm here because of grace, because of the anointing, not because of strength, might, or abilities. I'm here because God put me here. I remember the first church we took. I think I was about 24 years old maybe. So we were just kids and we, we were senior pastors in a church with primarily just old people. Uh, and, uh, and I remember I would study literally all week long to get, we had three services. That was back in the old days when people went to church. Uh, we had three services. And so to preach three times a week was a chore for this young boy. I worked all week long to get those messages. And of course, I had to go around and visit my little old people. And so I'd get my little Honda 350 and put one boy between my legs and one behind me and put, 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 put to the old people's houses, you know, a couple times a week. And uh, that was ministry. And I was younger than probably most of their children. But they respected me and honored me. But it was because... It was because of the Lord in me, not because of me. Because I was just a kid. And I want to say this to you. When God promotes you, it's not based upon your abilities or your age. It's not based upon what you know or what you don't know. I, I've known a lot of people in the ministry that were walking theological discourses and books. I mean, they were a walking Bible. And yet, God had them in a place to where they... Didn't have much ministry at all. Not much outlet at all. But you have to be content because there's a work going on. I've also known people that had massive crowds and couldn't preach their way out of a wet paper sack. I mean, it was like you're scratching your head and you're going, I don't understand this. This guy's got thousands of people and he never has anything to say. I mean, you don't go tell him that. but you know, And you're thinking, what, what's going on here? God has his way of doing things. And God uses people in spite of them. Hello. To God, character can be weightier sometimes than knowledge. You may know everything. You may be an expert at, quote, ministry. But if you don't have character, God's not going to be able to use you very far. Hello. If you have character, you will be devouring the word of God. You will be absorbing the word of God. And God knows that you will grow fast. And that you will rise to the occasion. But because you have character and integrity, he's able to use you. Amen? So I want to encourage you. I'm not discouraging anybody from learning. Amen? What I'm saying is, is that don't discount yourself. God's the one who promotes. Not other men and not other people. <clears throat> Never be angry with a leader for not giving you an invitation to serve in some area of ministry. Believe and trust that we are where we are because God has determined it. And we will be moved into greater ministry position when the Lord decides it is right 
for everyone involved. So the Lord makes the decision, doesn't he? God chooses, doesn't he? And here's the cool thing about God. We may wonder sometimes why nothing's changing in my life. Why God's not moving me forward. God knows exactly what he's doing, though. And it's all in a plan that he has outlined for you. God doesn't always tell us what needs to be changed in our lives because he wants it to be worked out in our lives. He wants us to grow, and growth is a process. Uh, I have to confess, and I'm sorry, with my two oldest sons, I tried to grow them up too fast. For some reason, I don't know why, I thought that they ought to be the best kids in town. I thought that they ought to be the smartest. They ought to be the most talented. They ought to be the most well-behaved. And I expected too much from those two children. Well, by the time they got grown and the two younger ones came around, I realized that my expectations were futile. We just got to trust the Lord in this. Amen. What am I saying? I'm saying that there was a place I realized that a two-year-old is going to be a two-year-old. And a 10-year-old is going to be a 10-year-old. You can't make a 2-year-old a 10-year-old. Right? Well, when it comes to things spiritually, we have to look around us and we have to be willing to say, hey, some of us are, some of us are 90 years old in the spirit. Some of us are 2. We can't expect from the 2-year-old what we expect from the 90-year-old. Amen? We, we have to be pleased and satisfied with what's going on in their lives. A two-year-old, you're just glad they're learning to run now. You're just glad they're learning to, to recognize colors and, and, and they're, they're, they're beginning to pick up on a, a, a more difficult words and things of that nature. But a 10-year-old is different. Amen? And so we need to realize that we're where we are because we're growing. And growth takes time. Listen closely. I'm just going to read this breakdown of this so that you can get it clearly. Um, this is where integrity comes into play. The passage that we just read in Psalm 75 tells us that God has a cup in his hand. He pours the rich red mixture of wine from one cup to the next. This process is representative of our lives. We are the mixture. We're the rich red wine in the cup. The pouring describes divine movement from one stage in our lives to the next stage. Each time we are stirred up and poured out. Did you get stirred up? The stirring up is when you feel like your life is coming apart. You feel like you're spinning. And you start saying, I think change is coming. Something's about to happen. And it doesn't feel good because we like to be calm and settled and rested in the hand of the Lord. I'm in control. We think we are. We never are. God's really in control. I'm in control. I've got my little position, my little ministry role, my home, my family, my job. And all of a sudden, God starts stirring the water or the wine. Your, your life is the wine. With all its adventures and all its spices, with all its fun, and also it has some sticks in it. It has some flesh in it, some pulp. It has some peelings in it. And you don't want that in the wine. Hello? Why? Because... In the end, we're going to all be poured out and the king is going to drink. But he's not going to drink until we are purified. The wine is purified. There's no more flesh in it. There's no more sticks in it. There's no more seeds in it, right? So the pouring describes divine movement from one stage in our lives to the next. Each time we are stirred up and poured out, often to find we ended up somewhere other than what we expected. Sometimes we think God's surely going to pour me up to another level and he pours us back the other direction and we're going, God, yeah. and we want to point fingers at somebody. Well, it's his fault. It's her fault. You've got to go back to this passage we just read. Promotion comes from the Lord. He sets up one and he puts down another. Yes, sometimes God moves me in the opposite direction. In order for me to learn a lesson, I should have learned earlier, but I didn't get. So what happens? I go to summer school. Hello? I have to go back and pick up what I missed, so to speak. But don't fear. It's not God despising you. It's not that man or woman over you who told you you're getting moved over here. It's all about the timing and the work of the Lord 
He's stirring up the mixture in your life. He's pouring you into another cup. The cup is simply where you're being used. The cup is simply how God uh, holds on to the, the you that's inside. The wine is you. Okay? <clears throat> Often we find we ended up somewhere other than what we expected. During this process, the dregs, the stems, the old seeds, the pulp, and the flesh settle to the bottom of the cup and are discarded, purifying and refining us into great leaders of integrity. See, here's what happens. God stirs it, and all that junk, as it begins to settle to the bottom of the cup, then he pours us. When he pours us, the junk stays in there, but the drink comes out, the wine comes out. What does he do? He tosses the stems and the seeds and the pulp over here. We think, surely, God, I'm pure enough now. But we never really know until he starts to stir again. And when he starts to stir again, sometimes we find that there's still some things in our life that need to be discarded. And so what does God do? He pours us over here. It may be a promotion up. It may be a promotion to the side or even down. But God is always in it. And with each stirring and with each promotion, there's a purifying. There are new things we learn. There are new things we let go of. There are new things we accept. There are new things we grow in. Amen? But eventually, there comes a process to where God stirs us, and He stirs us, and He stirs us, and we settle. And when He begins to pour us, there's nothing in it. So what does He do? He takes it and He drinks. That means that in our life, we have reached a level of maturity to where he can truly enjoy us, truly use us, truly we make an impact. The Apostle Paul said, <clears throat> he said, I fought the good fight. I am ready. Amen. He said, I am ready to be poured out as a drink offering unto him. That's powerful, isn't it? Amen. And that's when God really begins to use us in ministry. In order to really use us in ministry, we have to get all the junk out. This is when you reach the place to where ministry is not about you. It's not about fame. It's not about money. It's not about recognition. It's not about what the people think or want. It's about him and him alone. And then God says, now I'm going to pour you out where you will powerfully be used for my kingdom and my glory. Amen? Amen. So with a promise like this, you know, ultimately we know we're going to end up in the blessings of the Lord. Amen? We're going to end up where God is going to promote us. And he is going to bring us to the place that he wants us to be. Amen. Uh, so <clears throat> it's a powerful place and a powerful thing. Integrity reaps a harvest of perseverance. And perseverance is just patiently waiting. It's waiting on the Lord. And as we wait on the Lord, the Lord works in our life. And as he works in our life, we become purified and we're used by him. Amen. Then I want to close by reading Psalms 92, verses 10 through 15. But my horn thou shalt exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye also shall see my desire on my enemies. And mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. And there is no unrighteousness in him. Praise God. He's talking about being planted here. But he's also talking about anointing and fresh oil. And he's saying here that as we grow in character with the Lord, we begin to understand the fundamental priorities that make us strong and that make us usable for him. And he outlines several of them. He says that he's going to cause um, <clears throat> us to see the desire of our enemies come to pass. That's what he just said there. In other words, they're going to be defeated. He says that his ear shall hear of my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. And his desire, or our desire of our enemies shall come to pass. He says the righteous will flourish like the palm tree. Amen. There's characteristics about the palm tree. The palm tree uh, is created by God to survive in the worst of drought situations. The palm tree has a tap root that over years grows down as deep as it is tall. So a palm tree can live in the Sahara Desert where nothing survives and nothing lives. It's phenomenal. The palm tree is flexible. It grows straight toward the sun 
But when a storm comes, a palm tree can outlive a hurricane. A palm tree can literally bend over and touch the ground, and when the storm is done, it springs right back up toward the sun. This is a lesson for us. That when attack comes, when the enemy rises against us, we are rooted, we are planted in the house of the Lord. Our taproot is drawing nutrients and freshing living water from deep below, so much so that it holds us planted to the ground. Everything outside or exposed to the enemy seems like we're getting defeated. But when the storm stops, we spring right back up toward the sun. Amen. Isn't that powerful? That's awesome, amen. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. The the, uh, cedar trees of Lebanon were chosen by David to be used as pillars in the house of the Lord because the Lebanese cedar was the tallest and strongest timber that they had available. It was pricey. It was precious. And God said, I want you to build the pillars in my temple out of this particular cedar wood and you and I are to grow into pillars in the house of God you know we grew up with this traditional thing well we got we got old sister so and so and brother so and so they're the pillars in this house but that's not God's plan God's plan is for every single person in the house to become a pillar amen amen so that when the winds blow when the storms come the house is not shaken because there are pillars Far more pillars than what's necessary to hold the roof up. But they will maintain and sustain any storm and any warfare. Amen. Amen. He says here that those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. The best place to flourish, the best place to prosper is planted in the house of God. It's wonderful and it's perfectly fine to go off and hear someone, you know, on a special night for a special occasion and get prayed for by them, but there is no anointing and there is no direct blessing intended for you from God than where you have been planted by God. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says that he plants members in the body where it pleases him. We're talking about the anointing. These are elements of character. God builds you into a strong person, into a pillar. You're like a palm tree. You become one who is powerful in the things of God. And then God causes you to begin to flourish because no matter what comes against you cannot withstand you. God's God's favor is upon you and his hand is upon you and you're going to flourish. And the scripture says in verse 14 that you shall bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. It don't mean this kind of fat, amen. But rather it means with abundance, amen, and flourishing. Here's the reason why, verse 15, to show that the Lord is upright. What has our series been on? Integrity. Righteousness. Listen, don't let anybody tell you that prosperity is not righteousness. Don't let anybody tell you that prosperity or integrity is not righteous. And it's not blessed of the Lord. God blesses those who choose to live upright before Him. And your life becomes a testimony to Him. That's what we just read right here. Your life becomes a testimony. People look at you and go, that man, that woman has such integrity. And you know, it just seems like everything they put their hand to prospers. It just seems like they flourish all the time. Why is that? Because it's showing forth the glory of the Lord on your life. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So I'll tell you what. Why wouldn't you want to have integrity? Amen? Why wouldn't you want to walk? upright before the Lord and be blessed in the things of God. Amen. Let's bow our heads here. Father, I want to thank you for uh, this small Christmas crowd we have here today. I ask you to bless them. Lord, I thank you that these are men and women who have integrity. They are people that are, that are walking lives of character and honesty, equity, righteousness, and holiness. Father, we desire to come together to be a people who serve you, Lord, with integrity, who serve you, God, with honor, that we might bring forth glory to your name. Use us, God, for the kingdom of God. And Lord, I just release the blessings. I release the prosperity of the Lord upon each life here today. And I thank you, God, as we walk sowing good seed, forgiving and, and, and loving people, sharing and giving into the lives of others, that we might show forth your goodness and your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray today. Amen.